Hey guys, welcome back to the tutorial. Last episode, we downloaded and opened up the skeleton project. In this episode, we'll start setting everything up. First, we'll tackle setting up the player and player movement. To get started, we'll create a game object for the player. We have a model, but for now, for simplicity, we'll just use a capsule. If we right click in the hierarchy window, we can create a new 3D capsule object. In the scene in the game windows, you should be able to see a capsule sitting there. This will be our player for now, so we can name the object player. You can see that we have some components here. The transform is to keep track of location, rotation, and the scale of the object. The mesh filter and mesh render help to display the object, and the collider allows for it to collide with objects. We'll get into more detail on these components later. To control the player, we want to write a few scripts. The first one we want to make will be used to be the main controller of the player. In the project window, inside the folder labeled scripts, we're going to make a new folder for all the scripts involving the player and create a script called player controller. Open up the script using your editor of choice. I'll be using Visual Studio for this tutorial. It may take some time to open, so don't worry if it takes too long. In this tutorial, we'll be following a few conventions. First, you see that we have a few default functions in the script that we've just made. Start runs at the beginning and initialization of a script, like when the game starts or when an object is spawned or when it's set to active. Update will run every frame of the game. We're going to remove these from this script and every script that we'll be writing because not every script will need start or update. But if we do need it in a script, we'll add it back. Next, to keep our code organized, we're going to be creating code regions. This allows us to keep functions and variables categorized and easy to find. To make regions, we need pound region, region name, and a an pound end region at the end of region. So for the first one, we're going to create a region for private variables. As the name implies, this is where we're going to declare all of our private variables. Another convention that we're going to be using is labeling our variables. Variables can come from different places and serve different purposes, like private variables or variables that we reference from other scripts or objects. For example, for private variables, we're going to be prefixing each variable name with p underscore. So a private variable for player velocity will use p underscore velocity. We'll have other examples of this later on as we need them. For this velocity variable, we're going to have it represented as a vector 2, so we know what direction the player is moving in. Finally, I'll be including comments at the top of many variables and functions as a quick explanation of what each variable and function does. This is very, very useful when working on a team, since this is a good and concise way to communicate your code. So while I highly recommend commenting the code, I also realize it's a lot to type. So don't feel pressure to comment everything if it's more useful to just listen to explanations than copying down every single comment. Great, now that we have all of that out of the way, we can start getting into the meat of things. The first thing, aside from creating our private variable and region, is to set up a region for initialization. These are functions that will be called first and only once per object. An example of this is the function start, like I've mentioned before. Another function is awake which is like start, except that awake runs first before any other function, which makes it a good place to initialize your variables. Here, we'll initialize our velocity variable to 0, 0, so that our player starts off not moving. Next, we want to update velocity based on what the player's input on WASD are. To do this, we're going to create a region for functions that handle updates, called main updates. This is where the update function will go. We want to create three new inputs here, one for forward input, horizontal input, and our minimum input threshold. We want each of these to be floats. For forward and right, we want to get the player input, which we can get by using input.getAccess. In Unity, we have some predefined default controls that can be accessed by input. Here, in input settings, you can see that horizontal is determined by A and D. Horizontal is what we call an axis, since there is a scale of what the input value is, as can seen by the fact that input.getAccess returns a float between negative 1 and 1, where negative 1 is left, or A, and 1 is right, or D. You can also get inputs from a button or a key instead of an axis. A button would be something here that's not on a scale, like jump which is just a key press. A key would be an actual designated key, like A or D, like a hard set input. 
So for forward, we want to access the axis vertical. Likewise for right, we want to access the horizontal axis. The threshold is a value to make sure that we don't move if the player doesn't press hard enough on a key. Usually, you'll get these values by testing the game and tweaking values, but we've already done that for you, and we'll set this to 0.3. This will be important later for when we implement animations, so it doesn't look like the player is sliding around. Next, we want to set some conditions and checks to make use of the threshold. We want to check that the absolute value of the input is within 0 and the threshold value. If it is, then we set it equal to 0. We want to repeat the same thing with the right value. Once we have those checked, we can set velocity to right forward. Next, we'll be making some more variables. These variables, though, aren't going to be going in the private variables region. We're going to make editor variables. If you've noticed, we have private variables, which by CS practice, we want to keep all of our variables private. However, for convenience, we may want to be able to access some of our variables from the Unity editor. If we make our variables public, we could do that, but then it would be a public variable. But we also have a way to do that while keeping our variables private, serialize field. This allows us to have private variables while letting them show up in the editor. This way, we can set the value of a private variable from the editor instead of inside the code. Another aspect of editor variables is that you can hover above the variable in the editor and a description of the variable will pop up. This can be done using tooltips. Just like the comment descriptions, you don't have to add these in if you don't want to. If you can understand more by listening and not writing more than you need to, go for it. This variable will be player speed, so the tooltip will reflect that. And finally, editor variables will be prefixed by m underscore. So this float for speed will be m underscore speed. The next variable we want is a component that will be attached to the game object, rigidbody. Rigidbody essentially tells Unity that its built-in physics engine will be affecting this object. Once we go back to the editor, we'll attach this onto the player object. But for now, we want to create a variable for it. To do this, we want to create a new region called cached components. It will hold all of the variables that are components from the host object. To do this, we'll create a new region called cached components. It will hold all of the variables that are components from the host object, like a rigid body or transform, so that we don't have to access them every time that we need them, which can be costly. So we'll create a variable for a rigid body. The prefix convention for cache components will be cc underscore, and we'll name it rb as a shorthand for rigid body. The rigid body will be set in the awake function by using a function called get component. This will search the object that the script is on and look for the component that is specified inside the angle brackets. If it doesn't find the object, cc underscore rb will remain null and will throw a null exception error if you try to call it next time. If it finds multiple, it will take the first one that it finds. Now, we want to actually move the player along. To do that, we'll be making updates to the rigid body. We do have the update function, but for code involving physics, we want to use fixed update, which updates after a fixed amount of time. Update runs every frame, but frame rates can be variable between systems. Fixed update negates that problem by running on a set time frame. In terms of actually moving the player, there's a few ways of doing this. We can use the function add force, manually setting the force, or move the player's position, just to name a few. For this, we're going to use rigidbody's built-in function of move position. This will move us to the position that we provide for the function. However, this will involve some math. We will give it the current position. The direction is determined by transform.forward, which is the angle that points forward for a transform. The distance is determined by the velocity multiplied by the speed and the time between fixed update runs which can be accessed using time.fixedeltaTime. We'll multiply these together 
and add it to the current position. Drawing a diagram is usually helpful for understanding vector math. This code in update will move the player around. Let's make sure we save this file and go back to the editor to test it out. While we're writing code, it's important to go back and test your code every so often just to make sure that you're on track or you haven't broken anything yet. Back in the editor, we want to click on the player object and attach some of the components that it needs. First, it needs the player controller script. So we can attach that by dragging the script onto it or by clicking add component and searching for it. If it doesn't show up or you can't attach it, make sure that you don't have any compiler errors in your script. Let's set the speed variable to 12 for now. Next, we want to attach a rigid body component onto the player. Like with the threshold variable, normally you'd want to play around with these variables to find what you think feels best, but we have some variables and settings ready for you to use. We want to set mass to 1, drag to 2, angular velocity to 0.05, and freeze the x and y rotations. This makes sure that the player doesn't flip around when it shouldn't. These settings will also allow us to move around in a nice responsive way. Before we test it, we also need to create an environment for the player to move around on. We want to make sure that our player's current position is at the origin. We can do that by setting all these variables in the transform to 000, or we can right click the transform and reset it. Next thing we want to do is to make a floor. In the hierarchy, we'll make a plane object so that the player can stand on. It'll be positioned at 0, negative 1, 0, and have a scale of 4, 4, 4. Now, we can test out the player and see that it moves. If you notice, however, the camera does not move with the player. We'll get to that in the next episode, but for now, we'll get started with rotating the player around based on the camera. Back in player controller, we want to create a new editor variable for our camera object. We'll be using the transform of the camera so that we can handle the rotation. We'll be making all the updates to the camera rotation inside fixed update of the player controller after we've moved the rigid body. First, we want to set angular velocity of the rigid body to zero. This will help with any clipping issues that might occur and cause the game to think that we want to keep rotating. Next thing we want to do is to check if the player is moving. We'll check that using the squared magnitude of the velocity. The reason we use squared magnitude is just because we don't want to have to take the square root of the magnitude, so it's faster than magnitude because of less computations. These diagrams are drawn in 2D, but since we're only moving in two dimensions, they're still applicable, so don't worry too much about changing it to 3D coordinates. We'll be getting the angle that the player is going in with respect to the y-axis. Once we have this angle, we want to apply this angle to the forward direction of the camera. If we take the difference in degree between this vector and the forward vector of the player, we can find the target angle of the player. So to do this in code, we'll call vector2.signedAngle of the up vector and the player's velocity vector. We want to set a vector3 variable cam forward to the forward angle of the camera, so that we'll have a reference to it in the future. We'll multiply the sine and cosine of this by the x and y coordinates of the camera's forward direction to get the target direction. We can take the sine angle of this compared to the player's forward direction to find the target angle. We'll pass this into the rigid body's rotation using quaternion, which is a mathematical structure that stores and deals with rotations. Its main benefit is that it prevents gimbal lock. If you are interested to know more, please either find a facilitator or feel free to do your own research. Interpolation is moving from one point or vector to the values of another. We're interpolating between the original point at rigidbody.rotation and the new rotation angle we want the player to be at which would be the current rotation multiplied by the new rotation, which is notated by theta. This is all we need to get the player rotating. Back in the editor, we can set the camera transform component in player controller and test out our player rotation. As you can see, the player now rotates around. The last thing we want to do now is create a player prefab, 
A prefab is a template for a game object so that we can easily create duplicates in the scene, create instances during the game, or create references to it. So to make the player a prefab, open the prefabs folder and drag the player object into it. This means that we now have a copy of the player object saved. If we make changes to the player in the scene, it won't automatically update the prefab, but we can apply the changes that we make up in the corner. We'll want to be doing this periodically so that any other instance of this prefab that are in the game or the scene will also get updated. You can also make changes that will automatically save by going into the prefab preview by clicking the arrow or double clicking on the prefab. As long as the autosave box is checked, the prefab will be saved no matter what changes you make. Prefabs are very useful for a variety of things, as you'll see later on. A good habit is to make sure at the end of each episode that you've saved all of your scripts, updated all of your prefabs, and saved your scene. This keeps your project up to date and helps minimize losing any information if Unity crashes. You can check if any scripts are unsaved, which will have a star at the top of the script name. Same goes for scene, which will be up here. For prefabs, any bolded components or values in the inspector that you notice means that something is different than the prefab that was last saved. To save it, click on Overrides and select Apply All. Now we've got our player moving and the camera rotating along with our player. We've covered some basic Unity functions and components, initialization and updates. We've also gone over a bit of math, inputs and prefabs. In the next episode, we'll finish implementing the camera so that it rotates and it follows the player around. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next part.